How many God breezes? A little more heavier than a grain side than I normally present to. Uh, I, I'm not a grain farmer. I don't have any grain. But I do have crops. I just harvest them a little different. Okay, first off, I don't uh, like to hide behind the podium. If you guys really want to throw stuff at me, I'm an easier target. Okay. Uh, right off the bat, I'm going to warn you, I am going to insult you. I'll probably offend most of you. I do actually apologize. I sincerely don't really need to, but I kind of do. Um, all I want to do is give you some new ideas. Think outside the box. What works on my operation isn't going to work for yours, right? We all have different advantages, different disadvantages. So all I'm going to do is throw a whole bunch of ideas at you, and hopefully something you can take home, right? But, yeah, this is kind of like my get out of jail free card. Now I can say whatever I want. I have an advantage, though, is that really, if you guys don't like what I have to say, you can phone my boss. But I sleep with her, so you probably won't. <laughs> the mission statement of my uh, ranch is economic sustainability for generations. Okay, if management practices don't take me in that direction, I don't do it. And in that economic sustainability is I also have to be environmentally sustainable. Because I can be environmentally sustainable, I can clean the water, clean the air, all those warm and fuzzy things, and I can go broke doing it. So I have to be economically sustainable as well. Because when I'm economically sustainable, I have to be environmental. Because I need to do that for generations. So I have to take care of my environment. What I sell doesn't come in a box, a bag, or a bottle. Okay, I sell management ideas, long-term solutions to the problem. And I believe in economic analysis as much. I'm going to touch on that a little bit soon. So to be economically sustainable and environmentally sustainable, do we all need to drive smart cars? Who drove here today in a pickup? The uh, electric cars. Do you know that they actually have a bigger environmental footprint than a Hummer? We haven't figured out disposal of batteries yet. Right? So we're not there yet, but we're trying. So, But if, if we do have to drive, drive a smart car, my one question is, why do you look so stupid when you're in it? <laughs> really? If you're going to drive a smart car, this is my next ATV. <laughs> this is at the dive shop in the Bahamas. This guy has too much time and too much money. Okay. I write a couple magazines, I do lots of presentations and seminars. Everybody wants to talk about production practices, okay? Production practices are fun. Um, bale grazing is sexy. People love it. So that's what I'm going to talk about today is some winter grazing management. But I want to first tell you a little bit about my business philosophy. Production practices are the last thing I'm worried about on my operation. Okay. What tells me what production practices I'm going to use on my operation? Right? You, Go to a conference and you hear the, the newest and greatest new production practice. Is it going to work on your farm? What's going to tell you if it works? Bottom line. Right. Money. Economics and finance have control which production practices I use. Okay, that's important. There's a difference between them. Economics is profitability, finances is getting cash flow. Two separate sets of books on my operation. And that is all dictated by human resources. Okay? Does it match my mission statement? Does it, uh, do I have a labor component to carry that out? So this, there's a veto power over economics and finances in my human resources. Okay? So that's the, real quick, my business philosophy, the production practices are down here. We're going to talk about production practices today. But just so you know, in my business, those things are more important. Right? I have 21 different landowners. Do you think human resources is pretty important for me? I have a lot of tea and cookies. <laughs> you live with landowners. It doesn't matter how good of a grazer I am if I can't find the land to graze on. Right? Or if I can't, can't find the customers to bring the cattle to graze on my land. Because I'm basically a private community pasture. I lease land and then I bring in the custom cattle. So I need the human resources is an important part. When most people think about human resources, you always think about your significant other, right? We have lots more business relationships than we have to foster as well. Um, there's a lot of people just outside my business that I have to make good relationships with, right? 
positive interactions to make sure that we can deal in the future. So it's really important to do that with all of your relationships as well. But this is really important too. I've got you guys. I've figured this out. Okay, really simple. This is the secret. <laughs> That's all you guys need to know. You can get each dial set perfect. And by the way, they, they adjust daily. <laughs> oh, I also actually told these girls our secret in here. It's pretty simple. Okay, if you get all the dials set right, maybe, just maybe. <laughs> who were grain farmers and who were cattle farmers, right? Okay, I'm a crop farmer. I just happen to use different equipment. Okay, I'm no different than you guys. Uh, I have a no-till drill. I see the lot on my pastures just by bringing in hay. I used to be upset with uh, farmers who let their hay get too mature. Now I love it because the seeds that come in. See all the clover that came in just with uh, bale grazing? Fertilizer spreader, I bring in loads and loads of nitrogen. I like my legumes. Actually, do you know that the air is 78% nitrogen? Every breath you take is 78% nitrogen? Why would you ever buy any? That's insanity to me. Remember that get out of jail free card I had? <laughs> manure spreader. I've hauled manure once in my life in 1997. It was the dumbest thing I ever did. <clears throat> I've never hauled manure since. I made sure my cattle put all the manure up there for me. I have a sprayer, I control, there's no such thing as a weed, I have a, a pretty good part of one of my presentations on weed control, no such thing as weed, I use the animals to control all my issues that I have out there. There's uh, reasons for every plant that's out there. Heavy arrows, if I want to stimulate some soil, I got some pretty heavy arrows. Combine, I harvest my crops. I've been a, marketed myself as a customer for grain farmers. If they have a, uh, a crop failure, hailed out, just a drought, uh, residues, anything, I'll go in and graze after, clean up residues or, or salvage crops. Did you know that a cow is 80% inefficient? 80% of what she takes in comes up back in. Why would nature make such an inefficient critter? I mean, I know if man made the cow, if we made a replica of a cow, We'd make her 95% efficient, wouldn't we? Isn't that what we're like? Why did nature make her so inefficient? Because it's not for the benefit of the cow. Okay, as cattle producers, we look at the cow as the be all and the end all. That's our money maker, our profit center. Nature looks at it as that's a, she's a tool in the system. We need to be able to recycle nutrients into the ground. In the rainforest, there's no room in the animals. Do you know why? Why does the rainforest not have any room in it? No grass. No, there's lots of plants though. Because the bugs are constantly decomposing the plant material, right? All the dead plant material. The bugs are uh, 365 days a year. In any environment that has a dormant season, winter, desert, uh, nature has a ruined animal because that dormant season needs a place for the bugs to decompose material. So that's why we have ruins in our environment. So I honestly think it's really important that every grain farm should have cattle on their farm because you're recycling that nutrients. There's no bugs alive in the winter to, to decompose that. So that's where the bugs are. That's where nature wants the bugs. The cow is only a tool in that. I use her as a, as a tool to harvest my crop. Summer and winter. Could you imagine if I told the grain farmers that you should kick 80% off the back end of the combine? Would you be offended? We wouldn't have to fight over which color was better, would we? <laughs> but we'd probably be sustainable. Ah, uh, okay. I do have a this is my tractor. I've been uh, ranching since 1996, and I have yet to own a tractor. I've never owned a tractor. Uh, I'm not gonna lie to you, there is a tractor on my farm. Okay. <laughs> One of the most important parts
parts of my business is the economics and finances. I do a gross margin analysis for my economics, and everything gets run through that. One of the key things that I've learned is that when I do an economic analysis, I figure out which production practices are working and why, and what I need to have as inputs, if they are economical for me. Um, one of the most biggest breakthroughs my operation ever had is learning how to do a gross margin analysis. So I think it's a, a must all the way. And finances, of course, is the cash flow. Can you afford to do that? I'm not going to get into a lot of details on that right now. But uh, again, human resources is most important. Economics and finance next. Production practices below that. Okay, is that fair? I can move on. Or you guys want to stick with human resources? Uh, you like production practices. Can you guys raise your round? Is it possible here to raise your round? Or do we get too much snow? We can. Lots of heads on. Do you want to graze your own? Why would you want to graze your own? Cheaper. Cheaper. If it's cheaper. I had a guy in Ontario tell me that he couldn't afford to grow you around or graze you around because he got too many damn cull carrots. He layered, it was a feedlot, he layered in all the cull vegetables from the Ontario vegetable belt. And uh, he just got truckloads of it all for free. And he couldn't afford to graze because he got too many damn cull carrots. So let's put it in perspective. Economics is, is going to rule which production practice that I use. Okay. So we're going to quickly look at normal season grazing, residue grazing, swath grazing, and bale grazing. And just quickly go through them. I, uh, I only have 35 minutes, I think, to do a two-hour presentation. So, Dormant season grazing is basically just grazing your pastures. But being able to manage them so that you have them into the winter. Okay. There's a couple ways of doing that. The best way is to have managed grazing and have vegetative active growing plants when the killing frost hits. Because the killing frost is my hay vine. It makes some really good quality standing hay. Right? When that killing frost comes in and I've got stage two vegetative plants, because of my grazing management during the summer, some fantastic feed out there. Um, to be able to do that, what you get is quantity and quality. Okay, and then your cows are out there grazing some really good stuff. Um, I'm a picture of it. That's my December grass, pulled away under the snow. Because the snow actually works as a hay shed. The frost works as a, as a hay vine. I've had 15% protein in my grass in December. So to me it's important. Um, the other way to do it is to have stockpiled grass. Uh, this happened a few times to me where someone offers me a piece of land, but I already have all my cattle in for the season. So I end up just leaving that for the whole season and taking cattle there later. In that case, I have low quality, lots of quantity. Now I'm going to have to supplement because the quality is not there. So then you can get late into the season as well by, by stockpiling some grass that way. Um, the latest I've ever grazed in, I'm north of Edmonton, the uh, latest I've ever grazed is into February, is when I'm grazing on pastures. Both ways work well. You have to make sure you're doing some, some uh, forage testing. You've got to know what they're eating. If they can't, if you can't reach through the snow and get a handful of grass, then they're going to have trouble getting a getting a mouthful. So you got to make sure they're out there uh, being able to do it. Once the snow gets deep and frosty and ice and freezing rain, yes, you've got to watch it. And some of them can't handle it, but a lot of them can do just fine. Quite late in the season. This was last. Uh, last Christmas. Okay, swath grazing is another <coughs> production practice that I use quite a bit. Um, when it comes to swath grazing though, I must admit I'm a bit of a vulture. And I don't have any equipment. I don't seed any crops. So I'm, I'm a market for grain farmers. Any salvage crops I can uh, I take for them, residues, whatever I can. Uh, for example, a barley crop salvage in the winter, digging through there's actually uh, three different types of cows on swath grazing. There's your diggers. They're very aggressive. They're good at digging. Um, they open up the swaths. There's your cleanup crew, which ends up being maybe your skinnies. They don't clean up. Maybe they're missing some teeth. They're a little older. They're not quite as good as digging. They usually end up kind of straggling in behind. And they end up losing some condition. And then there's your opportunists. They stand beside the diggers. When the diggers pull up a big mouthful, they steal it right out of their mouths. I've got a few videos of that. They've done it numerous times. 
Don't tell me you've never benefited from somebody else's hard work. You can't hold it against them. I've done pea straw grazing residue a few times. Um, worked pretty well. I really liked, uh, uh, one year worked way better than the other because the swaths were a lot bigger. Once the piece got really dry, then it busted up and the swaths were almost flat. Um, but they did like it. Uh, it was uh, always, all three years the crops were swathed, not desiccated. I've heard some people say that when it's desiccated, the cattle don't like eating it as much. But I've, I've only had three years of swath. Uh, the one year was really good because in between, there is uh, lots of little baby peas growing. I'm not going to tell you the color of the combine that went through, but there was lots of little baby peas growing up after. It was a pretty tough crop. He was plugging up lots. And I love the fact that there was quite a few weeds in it too. Great for me. But he left lots of these little piles, little bunches. And I figured, you know, that's the best way. You know what, if we could just bunch this, because sometimes when the snow gets deep, you have trouble finding that swath. And boy, whenever that, there was that pile there, boy, they sure found it good. And they cleaned it up well. The very next year, somebody invented this. There's a, a buncher. It leaves bunches in the field. Awesome idea. The uh, Gator Research Organization, close to me, they bought one of these bunchers and they made it available to farmers. All the grain farmers in our area, anybody who's a member can use it for free. Come try it out. I was like, yes, this is awesome. We're going to do this. This is like a no-brainer. This gets cattle onto the grain line and it recycles all those nutrients. This is great. And now many farmers use it? I think now it's still maybe one or two every year that use this. I think this is a no-brainer for, if you've got mixed grain and cattle, this is like three feet. They clean it up well. A small pile like that, it's very user-friendly behind the combine. You can back up, very, you know, very little issues with it with backing up. It's not, it's not like the old chaff wagons that you had to dump and you couldn't back up. And they clean it up very well because they stand around it in a circle. When they crap, it goes off the back. If they lay down on it, the front end goes down on it. When they get up, everything's pretty well clean. So they clean it up. On a swath, they walk down it and they crap all over the swath, right? So you have a lot more issues with it. But really, really good opportunity for grain farms. They don't have to be pretty. Here's one I was at a tour one time. You can home it, make them homemade. I've actually bought full crop soft producers as well. For quite a few years, I had one farmer who just seeded me three quarters of oats every year. Now, the one thing I'll warn you with taking a full crop is a monoculture. Okay, I've had issues, two years I've had issues with the fact that it was a monoculture and there's been mineral imbalances or protein <coughs> imbalances. And I've had issues with the cattle. So, I prefer uh, polycultures, right? The more weeds I get, the bottom better. But if you're growing this for yourself. I mean, if you're trying to control um, control weeds that way, uh, you know, bring in another crop to, to knock them down a little bit, that's fine too. Cattle can nip, nip them down. Um, this, this particular crop, this is a good oat crop. Does it look good? It actually had very little protein in it. It was 5.9% protein. The cattle wouldn't settle. Right? You couldn't figure out why they wouldn't settle. I like fed them more. I gave them more swaths than I calculated it. Ended up it was a protein deficiency. I had to supplement on this crop because we didn't have enough protein in it. So every day I unroll the bale, hey, then they did fine. That's after the swath. See, with the protein deficiency, you see the stubble after they've grazed it? They chewed every little bit of stubble down because they were, there was an imbalance there. As soon as I started unrolling some hay with it, then it uh, kicked right in and they did fine on it. Then they didn't chew the stubble down. Uh, a couple of years, we had uh, pretty deep snow. This this particular year, you see how long they're pulling that out, nice long. We had freezing rain on the top. We had a layer of ice about uh, six inches down, and then the swath actually was frozen to the ground because we we got snow so early that year that it didn't really freeze. In January, I was still putting posts in it by hand under the snow, but that caused issues underneath, a little bit of molding. And uh, once it froze, those swaths froze down. So this is what they're pulling out after. They were trying to grab that little bit of stubble. They were having a lot of trouble that year. But I'll be honest with you, I've had more trouble swath grazing because of no snow 
than I have with too much snow. And we get a fair bit of snow up there. They dig very well through the, the snow to get that. Uh, my issues with no snow uh, has been water. Right? If I'm relying on snow for a water source for this cattle, boy, my labor goes up more than I planned. Uh, I, I much prefer to have some snow. The other issues I've had with not enough snow is if you get an inch of snow, everything's good. They got some water. They're grazing really easy. Easy to find the swaths. Then you get a really warm spell, right? It goes up to plus ten. That inch of snow melts and sinks right into the swath, and then you get a cold spell right after. It drops to minus twenty-five. You have concrete swaths. Literally overnight, you're out of food and water. So uh, you got to plan for it. It, it might happen. Bring in, you know, have some hay there already for that little bit. It'll dissipate over time and it'll work, but no snow's had more, given me more trouble than too much snow. Difficulties? Hard to find. Right? I, don't, I don't find myself any land that I manage, I put it in the pasture because it's uh, more profitable for me. And uh, for every 100 grain farmers that I talk to, one will work with me. Why do grain farmers not like cows? <laughs> I think every grain farmer needs needs to have them on there to recycle that nutrients. Um, extreme weather, when you're on a peace double crop residue and it drops to minus 47, they will stop grazing. <laughs> they just stop. They don't dig for it anymore. So you have to have a backup plan. I saw a body condition score that I lost in a week because of that. Um, as long as you plan for that cold weather, now I have a little bit of a bale grazing field set up in the trees. When the cold weather hits, and then turn into that, and then when it warms up again, get it back out on the field. Because I'm trying to recycle the nutrients back out on the land. Right? I don't know if any of you guys are going to be mad at me, but I shelter, I fence off the trees. You guys have a lot of trees here? <laughs> I fence off all my trees so that they can't go into it. Because the trees don't need the fertility. Right? So when it's that cold week, I'll kick them into there, but other than that, I want them out on the open so the manure is recycled out on the open. Feed quality, always tested. Uh, like I said, I've had mineral imbalances. I put cattle onto a um, oat swath graze. Within two weeks, I had two cattle go down because of a calcium magnesium uh, issue. So make sure you have some mineral out there and always feed test. Always monitor body condition score. I gotta pull some skinnies out. There's some cows that just can't cut it. Spring thaw. <laughs> First year that I grazed year round. I was so proud of myself. Yes, I'm going to do it. It's coming in April, and I've still got a month left. I'm out on a zero-till farmer's uh, crop field in the spring fall breaks. <laughs> Oops. I don't want to be grazing year-round. Okay, I want to move down to a bale grazing site or something during that period. But uh, I did it. Yeah, he wasn't that happy. He was a pretty good deal. He understood. But uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> well, I already said no snow. Honestly, all my wrecks with swath grazing have happened in February, March. Anytime I've had any issues, it's February, March. So, honestly, if you graze, plan the swath graze till, you know, chaff bunch grazing, residue grazing, swath grazing, till January, get after Christmas, you've done pretty well. If you, you know, that's in my environment where I have lots of snow. If you guys don't have as much snow, I know guys down in you know, Calgary or County Way that swath grazing works great for them. So if you don't get as much snow, by all means, um, it's a great option. Best I've ever done is 56 cents per head per day, and the worst I've ever done is $1.24. And that includes all my labor, right? Cost of uh, everything into the, the crop that the grain farmer put in, and all my labor and actually moving the fence, managing the cattle all, all winter long as well. I've silence grazed one year. I, I had a customer that wanted some feed, hay was expensive, I didn't have any swath grazing, and I had a neighbor who had two piles of silage. That was, one was four years old and one was five years old. So I paid him 75 cents per head per day and we just grazed through the pile. It works quite well actually, the silage pile works really well with electric fencing, because it's wet and it's grounded right through the ground even when the weather's frozen. So I didn't have any issues with electric fence there. You just put the post into the silage pile and just kept hammering it in. And we kept walking forward with it. So it worked quite well. Silage is a very efficient way to harvest feed. Okay? 
be a, a very short period of time, cost, you know, cost effective, get it up in a pile and it's you know, risk, low risk. It just happens to be a very, very expensive way to feed it. Right? The act of feeding it is very expensive. So if we can try and find somewhere in the middle where you can get both best of both worlds, that's, that's great. My favorite one is actually bale grazing. I've never had a wreck bale grazing. They, they, it's always worked well. The cattle will always come out fat. They don't get very few skinnies show up. You can argue that it's not really grazing because you're bringing in feed. Um, that's all right. I, I'll, I'll let you argue that. To me, it's the grazing mentality. The big reason I bale graze is because of the reduced equipment and labor costs. Okay, I can get my yardage down under 10 cents per head grade. And uh, it's, I mean, that's, a, that's the, the main reason I do it. The bonus I get is a bunch of fertilizer, too. It fertilizes the pasture. Just looking at it from the air. Basically, I like to have long rectangles, and then I strip graze using electric fence all the way down the rectangle. So on the left-hand side, we've already grazed that one, and just starting grazing the other one. It's a good area to view of. I love to have, uh, I don't have a tractor, so I use self unloading trucks. And these guys do a great job of setting it up for me. They just drive across the field, and they just start the chains. They don't even tip the deck up. They just dump the bales off. They already spread them for me. And I just use my bale truck and just spread them off. Okay. Or I'll hire the farmer who produced the hay to deliver this tractor and wagon. And then he spots them out there for me, and I never had to touch them with a piece of equipment. They're my cost for you lower. The key to bale grazing is to keep your costs low. You need to only touch your bales once at the most. There's a lot of people who bale graze, but they don't quite understand it. Okay, we've got to keep our yardage low. So you don't bring your bales in and put them in your hay yard. Okay, and then don't load them up on your wagon and drive them out to your field. And then don't unload them on your field. And then don't come out later and pick up your bale and pull the net back in off and set it back down. Okay, how many times do you touch the bale? You just, you know, messed up the whole reason why you're bale grazing. So you got to bring them out. Yeah. you got to bring them out and make them, plunk them right where you need to be. Okay. In this situation, I'm already utilizing my existing uh, infrastructure. I've got a bunch of paddocks set up for my summer grazing. So this producer, or this farmer, I'll bring them out and he'll put a load in each paddock. Okay. At his own leisure, he can bring it out whenever he wants. Nice days, doesn't have to come in a blizzard. And he sets them on all my packs. And then I just go and cut twine. So in that case, if he's bringing them in the winter, I'll put the bales on end. Twine's easier to pull off. Okay. I'll just start grazing through. Three or four days, I like a three or four day ration. Start grazing through my packs. When I'm getting close to being done, I say, okay, whenever you want, fill her up again. And they'll come out and spend a day bringing feed. I can pay him just as easy as I pay the bale truck guy. And he sets them up for me. Okay. In this situation, we would be setting them all out in the fall in advance and pulling all the twines off. And then uh, we're just going to strip graze all year. So I, I'll go and move fence on snowshoes. Not a big deal. Um, it's uh, way more cost effective than starting track area. And actually, to feed, uh, for example, one year I was feeding 350 head. And I would do about two hours worth of work a week feeding my cows, because most of the work was done in the fall, which really, pulling twine off 1,500 bales is a boring job, <laughs> really boring. <laughs> Have an iPad or, or an iPod or something to listen to, because it's a, the only thing that keeps you going is, it's better to do it in the winter, it's better to do it in the winter, it's better to do it in the winter. Because I can pull twine in the fall at about 40 bales an hour. In the winter time, I'm about maybe 10 or 15 bales an hour. And sometimes two bales an hour. Those are those days, eh? All froze down. So bale grazing to me is, a, is almost a no-brainer. There is, we did a bit of a study through the Gateway Research Organization. Uh, we brought in, I took one field, it was grazed the same the previous year. We put a fence right down the middle. I bale grazed on one side, and then I obviously didn't on the other side. This is the uh, field, started like that. That's what it looked like after all the fertility. I left a little bit of a gap in the front, you can see, just to give it some space in there. That's what it looked like in the spring. 
There's a few dead spots. People worry about dead spots too much. Right? Don't worry about it. It'll grow through it. Even if you have a dead spot that lasts a couple years, you've got four or five times the amount of growth around it. Right? You're ahead. You don't need to burn any diesel for that. So there it is a little bit later. Just the growth is phenomenal. The first couple years after the upgrade. Okay. There's the bale grazing site. There's the control. Okay. Um, quite a difference. The first year, the real benefit from bale grazing is going to be your water holding capacity and your urine. Because it's available right away. 80% uh, of the nitrogen coming out of the cow is actually in the urine. And through the manure hauling process, we lose most of that. A good chunk of it. So then it's readily available right away. And the water holding capacity is awesome. Um, year two and three and four and five and on, now we're getting the, the res residual hay breakdown and the manure breaking down and fertilizer. So there's a plant from the bale grazing side and a plant from the other one. And just a, a lot more growth. The other one's actually already going to seed too, so it's easier to manage in the summer grazing standpoint because it doesn't go to mature as fast. So the bale grazing pasture that year produced $90 in acre revenue. The non-bale grazing produced $43. So it had a difference of $47 in acre, over double the production. So basically I figured out that uh, in my situation, I don't need to own the cows. Right? I can still bring in cows and there's somebody that usually wants me to feed something. I can bring in animals and bale graze. And uh, they pay for the feed, they pay me to do it. I have actually found out a few times how to get an exchange student to do the work for free, and I get all the free fertilizer. So to me, the other reason is a no brainer. So the first year was a $47 an acre improvement, the second year was 38, 35, 28, 21. So you see it's coming down a little bit. Visually, when you look at those pastures, yeah, it's come down a little bit from that first year. It doesn't look quite as good. But the control also got better. The second year I had a bunch of clover come in. And my control got better because of my summer grazing management. So that number is not quite as distinct as it would be if you, because that other one got better as well. Why did no clover come into my bale grazing? It already has all the nitrogen it needs, right? The grasses have the, the advantage so they don't compete any legumes. 80% of what goes up into the cow comes out the back end. So I did a calculation years, quite a few years ago, you know, hay going through a cow, all the NKT and S that comes out the back end. Anyway, long story short, I came up with 30 cents per cow per day fertility out the back end by using imported feed. So imported feed because you have to bring it in, right? If you use your own hay, is that a net gain to your farm? Right? It's your hay, your problem for feeder to pay fall. So I use this number only if I'm importing hay in, because that's the net gain to my farm. So this 30 cents per cow per day, if I throw that into the mix, 200 cows for 120 days is $7,200 worth of fertilizer. Just because I had cows fed out on my land. And I don't have any manure holding costs, that's just fertilizer. Plus all the organic matter that's added in there. So to me, that's a no-brainer. Is that only for one year? Do you know how long that lasts? I showed at least five years worth of fertilizer of that. We've got some phenomenal pastures because I've been bale grazing on The problem with bale grazing is it's a really easy sell, right? I don't have trouble convincing that. It saves you time, it saves you money. Okay. I can only cover a little bit of land, right? With 350 head, I'll only cover 35 acres in a winter. 40, 50 acres. But all that other land, 3,500 acres, I gotta match up to. Summer grazing to me is more important. It takes longer, but I need to fix it through my summer grazing as well. The problem with that is a harder sell. It costs you time and it costs you money. Right? Whenever I talk about sell grazing, oh, put in all these paddocks. And we go, oh, I'm too busy making hay, I can't afford to move cows. Okay, well, it comes down to economics. In my operation, I'm too busy moving cows to make hay. Depends which one's making more money. So uh, every situation is different. You've got to make sure you understand the economics behind it. That's the quick and the dirty. Going on it. Five minutes ahead. I did good. Good. I raised my. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, you want the full full.
whole new deal is going to be an unlimited laughter soon. But um, we've got five minutes for questions if you want. Yeah? What size are your paddocks for summer grazing? The size of the paddock doesn't matter. It depends on the production of the paddock and the size of the whole cell. Okay? The number of cows or the size of the acres of the paddock isn't what determines if overgrazing occurs. Um, depending on your environment, you're going to need somewhere between 16 and 100 paddocks to be able to control your management property. So the size varies on the production and the whole size of your cell. Yes? What's your space when you try to get on your bales in between your bales? For bale grazing? What's the spacing between my bales? About 25 feet between the bales. And if I'm really going to be you know, trying to have really good fertility, probably a little bit more between the rows. But honestly, I like to do double every second row. If I'm going to do a bale grazing, it, it saves you a lot of headaches on the electric fence. Do every second row, and then on the second year, come back and fill it in between. So then I'd be every 50 feet. And then the second year, you come in and fill it in between. A lot of my pasture is bush, um, so I get, I get some native with that as well, but a lot of native pasture you might only want to wait, graze once a year. It holds its nutrient better it's, you know, later on as well. Have you had many dry years in your experiment? I have, I have. We've had a few, few dry years. Um, I'm originally from South of Lloydminster, a uh, little town called Lone Rock, so we're in the dry black soil zone there. Lots of sweet clover in the ditches. So I've, I've been in both environments. So does it take you a while to come out of something like that? I mean, you know, <laughs> next year, if you have two or three dry years, I, I mean, you're not going to come out too good. Are you talking summer grazing or winter grazing now? I'm talking summer. Summer grazing. Okay, summer grazing is more important in a dry, like good rotational grazing, more important in a dry area. Okay, there's a Highway 2 corridor from Calgary to Edmonton. I call that the idiot through the you can do whatever you want to, and it, it works fine. In a dry environment, it's even more important to do some good grazing management. Without getting into the whole school, but yeah, even more important. Yes? So do your cows need to go all winter? Some years, depending on the customer, right? If I have red heifers, the customer, you know, yeah, we want water, so I'll set up a system. But I've been bale grazing where, I mean, they're eating a dry feed then. Which sloth grazing, they're grazing through snow. So when they're eating, they're probably eat, eating 60% of their water. So to lick the rest is easy. But I've been bale grazing where now they're eating a dry feed where they got to go pretty well lick most of it. And a few years ago, we actually got down to there was not much snow left. I drive on the north slope of the hills to break up the, the ice or snow. Then underneath it, what it was, you'd, you'd go through the track and you put up, it was basically little hail pellets. And that's what they were eating, and they did quite fine on it. So, different situations. Yeah? What about wind? Wind, I have trees! <laughs> <laughs> How does it affect you? How does it affect me? The trees or the wind? The wind. Winter time now or summer? Winter. Uh, winter time, I've got lots of shelters in the trees. I mean, we get minus 47, I get them in the wind or in the trees then. Right? Or wind break. When I was in, in uh, Lone Rock in Saskatchewan there, I had wind breakers that I could move around. So definitely, yeah, wind is an issue. But I'm over half my land is bush. Good. Didn't offend anybody too bad. So what you're saying, you don't own the cows, you just lease them in. Uh, just custom. Oh, just custom. Custom. I don't. I don't lease. I don't own them. They come in on a custom basis, summer or winter. They're on custom. I did own cows, and I I did an economic analysis on it. And I saw that my custom grazing was making money and my cows were losing money. I was really good at grazing. I was bale grazing for like 60 cents a day. I had really good productive rates. Calving rates were awesome, but I was still losing money. And my custom grazing was working, so I got rid of the cows. But then what I figured out was that now my grazing is not getting all that free fertility. So that's when I brought in the custom cows to feed on the land to get the fertility back. Yes. I have a question. Earlier today, we had uh, heard a speaker talk about a trainer cow to teach the other how to eat cobs. Do you use a trainer cow to help to understand how to swap a grain, or do you just find that not to be a problem? I have. I've had different different cattle come in, and every 
time and it hasn't been an issue to get them trained, I mean, you don't want to probably throw a brand new set of cattle that have never done it on three feet of snow, right? I mean, if you start earlier in the season when there's three inches of snow, right, they figure it really easy. Then when there gets more snow, they already got to, you know, they got to figure it out already. I don't know if I'd throw in, you know, brand new into a, a really tough situation. No, I haven't had any trouble getting them to learn. They actually prefer to graze over being fed. I can put some bales out there and then go back to the swaths before they hit the bales. Okay, one more question if there is. 